everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Today's topic is going to be aquatic biomes. So like always, let me get you some objectives and we'll get started. So by the end of this video, two things that I need you to know or be able to do. First one, describe the conditions that dictate the characteristics of an aquatic biome. And the second is to describe the major aquatic biomes. Obviously, today is about aquatic biomes. Before we start talking about the biomes by themselves, let's go ahead and talk about conditions that uh, dictate what those biomes are like. So when we were talking about terrestrial biomes yesterday, terrestrial biomes were dictated by the plants that were able to grow in an area. As far as aquatic biomes go, they are classified by abiotic factors. So the major things used to classify one aquatic biome from another is the salinity, that would be the amount of salt in the water, the depth, and the water flow. Those are the three things that we're going to use. Those are the three things that I want you to keep an eye on as we go through the different biomes. Another thing that is used, obviously, to classify one aquatic biome from another is whether it is marine or freshwater. If it's marine, the water is salty. If it's freshwater, obviously, the water is fresh. So classifiers aside, let's go ahead and start talking about the individual biomes. We're going to start out with our freshwater biomes. First one that I want you to know about are streams and rivers. Now, those two words are kind of used interchangeably, but in general, streams are smaller and they flow faster. Rivers are bigger and they flow more slowly. Um, all bodies of moving water are going to start out as a stream somewhere up in a mountainous region or by a spring. Um, the source of water for a stream could be an underwater spring, it could be rainwater, it could be snow melt. Either way, streams are going to flow downhill as they come out of those mountains and out onto the flats, they're going to slow down, they're going to become wider, and streams are going to join together to form rivers. Um, as far as the food web is concerned, up in the upper regions of a river where things are of a stream where things are flowing very quickly, um, because the water is moving quickly, it's very difficult for things like plants to take root, and algae doesn't stay in one place long enough for it to be of any use. So the base of the food web in a stream or in a flat, fast flowing body of water is going to be any organic material that falls into the water. So that's going to be things like leaves and twigs and grasses. That's going to be the base of your food chain for animals like crayfish and other um, decomposers on the bottom of the stream. As you flow downstream into the river where things slow down, you can start to get plants that are rooted in the water, you can get algae, and those things are going to form the base of your food web. The other thing that you need to know about is colder water that is moving more quickly usually has higher oxygen content because cold water can hold more oxygen, and as that water bubbles over the currents, it gets mixed with air. As you get down into lower regions where it's a river and it's slower moving, um, warmer water does not hold as much oxygen, and because the water is moving slowly, it doesn't have a chance to bubble with the oxygen. So up in the stream, it's colder, lots of oxygen. Down the river, it's warmer with less oxygen. Next aquatic biome for you is going to be a lake and a pond. Now, kind of like river stream, lake and pond are used interchangeably. Generally, lakes are bigger, ponds are smaller. Um, these are characterized by standing water, so the water in these areas is not moving. They've got emergent vegetation. Emergent vegetation is vegetation that is rooted below the water, but extends up above the water. So an example of this would be like a cattail where its roots are submerged, but the rest of the cattail comes up above the water. So it emerges through the water. Lakes can be broken into a couple of zones. Um, the littoral zone that is along the shoreline where your emergent vegetation is. The limnetic zone is out away from the shoreline where the emergent vegetation no, no longer grows, but sunlight reaches. Then there's the profundal zone that is down at the bottom of the lake where the sunlight is not able to penetrate. The benthic zone is the muddy bottom. So know the zones of lakes and ponds. The next freshwater ecosystem for you is going to be a freshwater wetland. Um, these are areas of land that are occasionally to always submerged. They can occasionally dry out. They've got emergent vegetation throughout. So all the way across this ecosystem, there are trees and grasses and cactus cattails and stuff that are going to grow from the bottom up through the water. And there are basically three types of freshwater wetland. You've got a swamp. Swamps are characterized by trees. Trees are the dominant vegetation in a swamp. In a marsh, the dominant vegetation is going to be like cattails. So right there you see those cattails sticking up. That would be an example of a marsh. And then bogs are areas that have got like 
sycamore trees and they are highly acidic because of decomposition rates. So those are your three types of freshwater wetland. You also need to be aware of services that are provided by wetlands because ecologically speaking, they're kind of a big deal. They're a highly productive biome. So this is a result of the temperature and the water quality and the vegetation that grows there. They're just good, highly productive ecosystems. Um, they reduce flooding and drought. So as water flows down into them, they slow the flow of water so that the water has time to recharge down into aquifers um, and it slows the path of it as it heads to a larger body of water. So they reduce flooding. They also store water for droughts. They filter water. So as water flows through a wetland, toxins are going to be filtered out of it and it's going to be cleaned up into fresh water. They're also a fantastic nursery for migrating birds and fish. I'm going to hop over to our saltwater ecosystems. And the first one is a salt marsh. Just like a freshwater wetland, these are characterized by emergent vegetation. They are also highly productive, some of the most highly productive aquatic ecosystems on Earth. They do have emergent vegetation. Um, many of these are found in estuaries, and an estuary is a place where fresh water from a river mixes with salt water from the ocean, so they've got brackish water. Um, they are highly productive because those rivers bring nutrients off the land and wash it into the estuary, so that's one of the reasons that they are very productive. Um, Two-thirds of ocean species will at some point in their lives live in uh, estuary, usually in their larval stages. So know that about saltwater marshes. Then we got the mangrove swamp. Man, that picture looks bad. Sorry about that. A mangrove swamp is just like a freshwater swamp, characterized by trees. Um, the roots of a mangrove tree are submerged below the waterline. They are found on tropical and subtropical coasts. When I lived down in Florida, we had a ton of these. You saw them everywhere. Um, Obviously, the trees are salt tolerant because they're going to live in salt water. And the biggest thing, two big things that a mangrove swamp does is, one, they protect coastlines from erosion. So as storms or waves beat against that coastline, the mangrove swamps help to break the waves up and keep the sand from washing away. They are also fantastic nurseries for larval fish, and migrating birds also like to hang out in the mangrove swamps. Couple left. You got the intertidal zone. This is the band of coastline between high and low tides. So the high tide will come in to a point and then low tide will go back out. Whatever area is exposed between that high tide and low tide is known as the intertidal zone. Now, the animals that live in this organ in this area have to be adapted to very harsh conditions because when they're covered in water, great, pretty constant temperature, things are safe, things are happy. But then the tide goes out and they're exposed to the elements. So it could be hot, it could be cold. Obviously it's drier than being submerged by water. They've got predators that are trying to attack them. So the organisms that live in these areas are very tough. Um, lots of starfish, lots of clams, crabs, uh, algae, mosses, things like that live in the intertidal zone. Two left. Coral reefs, um, things that characterize a coral reef ecosystem. These are going to occur in warm, shallow waters. Usually tropical waters are where these things are going to be found. Also, they are found in waters that have low productivity, so not a lot of algae, not a lot of plankton. They are the most diverse marine bios system. These are biosystem, ecosystem. These are like the rainforests of the sea. Um, they've just got a tremendous amount of biodiversity associated with them. And the reason that coral reefs exist is because of a symbiotic relationship. So there's these little animals that are related to jellyfish. They are called coral polyps. And they're essentially a tube that's got little tentacles on the end of them. These corals secrete a limestone skeleton around themselves made out of calcium carbonate. And that skeleton obviously protects them from the outside. Now, as they secrete their little skeletons, the skeletons build together next to each other and over the top of each other to form a coral reef. These um, little coral polyps, because they live in water that lack a lot of nutrients, they have little algae that live inside of them symbiotically. And the algae are photosynthetic, so it's a good situation where the coral provides CO2 to the algae, and the algae uses that CO2 and makes sugar, which it gives back to the coral. So this symbiotic relationship is what makes sure that our little coral have got plenty of food to eat, and they're able to live, and then they make their skeletons and build up coral reef, which supports a vast variety of organisms. Now, unfortunately, our coral reefs are under grave, grave threat. They are one of the most threatened ecosystems on Earth, and there are really three major reasons. One is water pollution. Um, 
Chemicals get dumped in the ocean all the time, whether from ships or factories or whatever else. That pollution can obviously kill off the coral polyps, and if the coral polyps go away, then they just leave their skeletons behind. You have lost a huge chunk of the um, food web, and the coral reef ecosystem will essentially go away. Sediment can do the same thing. Uh, sediment blocks out the sunlight that gets to those coral, or that gets to the algae that live inside the coral. They stop being productive, and you also get a dead coral reef. And then the biggest one is bleaching. Um, bleaching is a situation where the algae leave the coral. When the algae leave the coral, obviously the coral die. Now, bleaching is a phenomenon that scientists don't quite understand, but they've got a couple theories. One is that rising ocean temperatures cause oil or oil coral bleaching so if the ocean gets too warm those algae leave their coral and take off um, another theory is pH if the water becomes too acidic then the algae leave their coral and take off and the coral reef becomes bleached and the last ecosystem for the day is going to be the open ocean now things to know about the open ocean know that it is the least productive of the aquatic ecosystems there is not much going on out there there is some plankton um, that is photosynthetic but Obviously, it's too deep for plants to grow or anything like that, so not a whole lot living out there. It is divided into a photic and a photic zone. The photic zone is the zone where sunlight can penetrate, so that's like the top 650 feet. The aphotic zone is everything below the penetration of sunlight, and then there's the benthic zone, which is the very bottom of the ocean. Um, as far as getting energy goes, our food chains are based on either photosynthetic algae or chemosynthetic bacteria. So way down in the bottom of the ocean, away from the reaches of sunlight around hydrothermal vents, there are bacteria that are able to break down minerals and use those as a source of energy that is known as chemosynthesis. So down at the bottom of the ocean in the benthic zone, those chemosynthetic bacteria are the base of your food chain. Up in the photic zone, you've got your photosynthetic algae and then everything in between basically falls on the feeds on the stuff that falls from the top and that's it. Um, I would recommend going back and checking through those, making sure you know the differences between the aquatic biomes. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and we'll see you again.